Randy Cohen uh, with Americans for the Arts in Washington, D.C. We are your national advocacy organization looking to connect every American to the arts in this country. Make sure everyone has the opportunity to engage, participate, create in the arts. Make sure every child in this country has access to a quality arts education. Just like all the great work the commission's doing here in San Diego, we make sure that's happening around the rest of the country. Um, I'm so excited to be back in San Diego. Yes, back in San Diego. I went to San Diego State University. Uh, woo, yeah, absolutely. Um, man, has that place grown. I don't think I can get in there anymore. Uh, it's, uh, it's really gotten to be quite an educational institution. You know, the, you know, the, the quality of my uh, diploma there is really growing. Um, and, uh, and then I had 10 great years here living in San Diego, working in the arts and in the community. And so it's just always a pleasure to be back. And you know, the museum here is beautiful. Balboa Park is beautiful. It's, it's just such a great reminder um, every time I come back here of how the arts can really um, just project a community into, you know, well, literally the next millennium. But I mean, it has grown. The downtown is completely developed and evolved, and it's all just built around the arts, arts, culture, tourism. Uh, and so it's, this is just a great story, and it's one I can tell you um, from my little perch in Washington, D.C., and as I travel across the country, folks are always kind of wondering what's going on there in uh, San Diego, especially now with this new economic impact study. And you already heard some of the numbers. We're talking about a billion-dollar industry here. So there's a fantastic story to be told. And and that's what we're going to talk about today, the economic impact of nonprofit arts and culture organizations and their audiences, and you know the impact on the economy. Um, I always like to remind everybody, and we kind of had some of this already, the fundamental reason that, you know, that we support the arts, that we're connected in the arts, and that's just what it does for us you know, as humans, as people, right? Arts are, are a fundamental component of our humanity, a fundamental component of our society that creates the communities we want to live in and work in. Um, um, it's, it's really, you know, it's what it means to be human, to express, and they, we've been doing this for a long, long time, and uh, I give you as an example, uh, Exhibit A there, uh, this hand-carved flute, which was found in a cave by some anthropologists uh, in Germany a couple of years ago. And um, these anthropologists were, you know, like, well, we're going to go explore these caves and study some, like, really ancient, you know, Stone Age cultures. And, you know, they thought, boy, wouldn't it be cool if we found a bowl or, or a spoon? Or what if we hit the jackpot and, and found a cave painting or something like that? Well, they landed upon this uh, flute, which is carved by hand out of animal bone, which they um, age uh, determined determined to be 35,000 years old. A 35,000 year old flute. Now what was interesting is in reading this article, and it was published in Science, you know, one of the top scientific journals in the world, and they were trying to figure out what was the purpose of this flute, you know? Uh, they thought, you know, maybe it was to help promote territorial expansion. Mm, you know, yeah. Or maybe to celebrate the hunt. All right, I could see that. Or related to the fertility ritual. All right, I could definitely see that. I kept, but I kept thinking, you know, maybe they liked the way it sounded. <laughs> Never showed up, but you know. Um, uh, you know, the arts fundamental to our communities, to our societies, and it's always an interesting story because it's really, you know, central to that, you know, society in some way. And yet everybody was already, you know, thinking about what were the pragmatic benefits of a flute back then. Now, um, this flute thing really stayed with folks, so we fast forward 35,000 years and we find the shame flute. Now this little ditty was made out of cast iron. You can actually find the shame flute in Washington, D.C. at the Museum of Crime and Punishment. <laughs> Feels like the entire city is a museum of crime and punishment these days. But uh, you know, it is a different place, I gotta tell you. Um, so uh, has it really, has it really only been like nine or 10 months? Um, so all right, he, I said he wouldn't get political and then he got political. Uh, anyway, so the shame flute was made out of cast iron. And this um, round part was actually clasped around a person's neck, and the fingers were shackled to this long iron tube. And the purpose of the shame flute was to punish bad musicians. <laughs> That's right, you got a gig at the Prince's Palace and you stank up the joint? Well, you know, they'd march you around town for a couple of days in the shame flute so everybody could laugh at the bad musician. You know, sounds a little barbaric, but uh, hey, they cared about their music, right? So, uh, you know, we'll give them that. So, arts, culture, central to our communities, central to our humanity, have been <clears throat> for a long time. I want to stipulate those benefits and just kind of move them over there and, and again, start to think about the arts in some very pragmatic senses here starting uh, with the economy. And 
Um, and then, you know, we're going to expand beyond there, you know, to the creative economy and 21st century workforce. We already heard about the importance of arts education and, you know, arts and healthcare. So much great work around here going. What we're really talking about is how do we build a healthier San Diego through the arts? And that is what arts and culture does in our community, in our city, in our parks. So um, arts and the economy, what? How's that work and everything? Well. A couple weeks ago, uh, I actually got to go to an arts event. You know, you think with Americans for the Arts on my business card, he must be going to the arts all the time. Lucky. And I was in much trouble getting out the door as the next guy. But uh, it was date night with my wife. And uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm newly an empty nester at home. So anybody who's on the cusp of this is in for glorious times. Uh, you know, your world is about to just change so much for the better. So with this new found time, um, and I like my kids too, don't get me wrong. But uh, um, so I've become a ballroom dancer. Uh, my wife and I are uh, ballroom dancing now, which is fabulous. So, you know, we usually going out on a date for us, usually meant going to a theater thing or, you know, a museum or something. But now it's about finding dance. And so there was this really cool tango performance uh, that we heard about. So we went home and, you know, got online and found the, uh, found the theater and the right performance and punch in our credit card numbers, print out the tickets. So we were ready to go, right? You know, and so. Um, two Fridays uh, uh, come, and uh, so now it's date night, and oh, got home from work, and all right, we're going to turn around and head back outdoors for, you know, the, the performance and everything, and I was informed that we'd be dressing up this evening, um, and so, but there was a new necktie waiting for me, uh, which was kind of cool. So this whole economic impact of the arts thing, you know, hadn't even begun, and there was already some economic, uh, you know, uh, retail impact going on. So, you yeah, know, but it was a cool Frank Lloyd Wright tie and everything, so on it went, on with the suit and on the way to the theater we stopped and had dinner right isn't that something we do a lot we you know went to a nice restaurant we spent 75 bucks and had a lovely meal and uh, and then from there it was off to the theater and uh, we parked in a parking garage next door and peeled off my 10 bucks and got my little stub from the guy and went into the theater itself. And it's one of those beautiful historic theaters, you know, that's been all, you know, beautifully renovated and it's got the frescoes on the wall and everything. So we walked around, looked at that and got our programs and sat down in the theater and, you know, looked at the beautiful, uh, you know, ceiling and the gold inlay and the beautiful chandeliers hanging down and everything. So I'll just pause there real quick because it's only five minutes to eight. You know, the performance hasn't even started yet. But think about all the industries that have already been touched related to, you know, just this one date night to the arts. Well, it started two weeks before when we got home and we went online and started, you know, looking at websites till we found the right theater. Arts organizations, they employ web designers and computer programmers. And we did the e-commerce, right? And we, you know, punched in our credit card and printed out our tickets. So now you got the banking people and the financing people involved. All right, so date night comes and I'm not sure where the necktie came from, probably someplace good, you know, because it was a good tie. And, uh, you know, so there was some retail spending involved with that. And then, you know, off to the restaurant. It's one of those uh, farm to fork places, so everything's grown within 50 miles. And so some of the $75 we spent going to those local growers and producers. They're starting to benefit from this uh, arts event out. And, uh, you know, the owner of the restaurant brings home entrepreneurial income, the waiter, uh, personal income. And then we go over to the theater and we park in the parking garage. Now, this happens to be a municipally owned parking garage. I can tell you, every time those 500 seats next door are filled up, most people are parking in that garage. 10 bucks, 10 bucks, 10 bucks. That city is raking, you know, um, on those parking uh, uh, charges. And before that there was renovated, by the way, you know, I think everything kind of shut down around, you know, five, six o'clock, the tumbleweed was starting to blow through town there. You know, then they renovate that historic theater. It's beautiful. And there's restaurants and some bars in the area. Now this parking garage, you know, is probably going well past midnight. So there's all kinds of revenue there. And, and even the guy working, you know, the attendant, you know, that's a job. Um, we go into the auditorium and uh, get into the theater. You know, the arts, every time you go to an arts event, you're always getting paper, right? Someone's always giving you a program or a publication or a one page or something. Well, someone in the community's got to write that material, right? There's a writer involved. And then there's a graphic designer that does the design. There's a printer uh, doing the printing. You know, if the arts community just adds up their printing costs um, and goes, you know, you will have the attention of your local printers, trust me. You know, we in the arts spend a lot of money at printers 
years. Uh, and that's, that's significant revenue for that whole sector. Um, and so then we go and sit down in the auditorium and you know, reading the program and everything and look at the, you know, the beautiful work and, you know, those chandeliers. And I can tell you, I used to run a theater and, you know, those beautiful chandeliers, those are not interns changing those light bulbs. You need electricians to get up there, right? So all of these industries related to just what, you know, this one date night out. Now, 8 o'clock, the curtain goes up, the performance begins, and that's maybe when people start to think about the arts as an industry. Wow, those dancers are amazing. They must be getting paid something, you know, so, uh, <laughs> poor dancers, um, you know, and uh, so um, that's one of the me important messages that's really going to pop out of this uh, study that arts organizations employ more than musicians and dancers. They employ accountants and auditors and plumbers and electricians and marketing people. Uh, you know, they purchase goods and services across the community, printers, delivery people, construction people. Arts really uh, is an industry. Is touching everyone. And so that's kind of the story we're looking to capture here with arts and economic prosperity. Make sense, everyone? Good? All right. So yeah, let's take this to scale a little bit. So what did we do? So arts and economic prosperity, a national economic impact study, one of the, the largest ever of its kind ever conducted, 341 study regions across the country. Everybody catch this technical effect? That was all me, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, so, you know, including City of San Diego, Balboa Park uh, District, we had separate uh, reports there. We were in all 50 states plus D.C. We studied communities as small as 1,500 people all the way up to 4 million. It doesn't matter if you're in a small rural community, a large urban city, a suburban neighborhood. If the arts are happening there, there is a measurable economic impact. We focus only on nonprofit arts and culture organizations. So um, we don't include, uh, you know, the motion picture industry or the for-profit galleries. You know, all a real fundamental part of our cultural ecology, but just not part of this study. Why just nonprofits? Well, when the city is making its investment or our businesses are uh, providing their philanthropic investments in the arts, those dollars are typically going to nonprofit organizations. And it's an appropriate question to ask. All right, we get quality of life, but what's the public getting in uh, return economically for that investment? And, you know, so that's, that's the story. What do we do? So we work with the city, uh, the commission, uh, we work with the tourism uh, um, uh, association, uh, and um, uh, to do this study. Uh, and we surveyed 293 nonprofit arts and culture organizations. Um, thank you to everybody who returned their surveys and uh, did their, uh, we appreciate that very much. We know they're not easy, um, but they're valuable and you'll see how valuable they are. We heard back from 137 organizations that's what we go with. We take a very conservative approach to economic impact. So we only use data from the organizations that provide it. We can put our hands on every number that I'm about to talk about. Um, we don't make estimates for non-respondents. And we got all the big institutions and the mid-sized ones. But you know, the, so we got most of the money. But the fact is, there's even more happening out there. All right, so what do we find out? Now let's get into the numbers. Nonprofit arts and culture industry in San Diego, city of San Diego, one point $1.1 billion, oops, so yeah, there we are, $1.1 billion. And that number is comprised of two figures. The one on the left, that's spending by the organizations, just those 137 responding organizations, $553.6 million of economic activity. It's like, this is, you know, this is huge. This is one of the biggest numbers in the country. It's just incredible. But that right there is a myth buster. We're not even into economic impact yet. People don't think about the arts as businesses. And what these data show us is arts organizations are businesses that employ people locally, purchase goods and services in the community, are members of the Chamber of Commerce and are driving tourism uh, to the region. Arts organizations are good business citizens. Now, like all businesses, they have an economic impact. No surprise there. I could, I could give you a $5 bill and my economist will chase you around and see what you do with it and you know, run that through his models and say, all right, here's the economic impact of that $5 transaction. Um, the dog catcher's office, the gas station, any time a dollar is spent, there's some kind of economic impact. But few industries generate that event-related spending that the arts do. And that's the dinner, the parking, the babysitting, the retail, the lodging, all related to the arts. So um, we worked, uh, so we did a total of 1,261 audience intercept surveys uh, at a whole range of arts events across the city. 
a ridiculous oversample. Um, boy, San Diego way over delivered on the audience surveys. So these data are so solid, so reliable. This is a good thing, by the way. But I mean, that's, you know, the bigger the number, the more reliable the data. So fantastic uh, audience spending data. What we found is that the typical attendee to an arts event spends $45.66 per person, per event, not including the cost of admission. Those 137 responding organizations, 12.4 million attendees, you know, you pack up the math, and that's how you get $546.4 million in event-related spending by arts audiences. All right, so that's the economic activity, $1.1 billion. What's the economic impact of that? Well, to measure that, we work with a team of economists from Georgia Tech School of Economics who customize what's called an input-output analysis model for every community that we study. Let me just say this. Imagine your worst calculus nightmare. That's what these things begin to look like. You know, it looks at wage, labor, commerce data at the local, state, federal level. It looks at 533 industries in every community and how dollars go from industry to industry. It takes a million calculations just to come up with the San Diego numbers. We do this rigorous methodology for every single community that we study. Why? Because $50 spent here in San Diego is going to have a different economic impact than $50 spent in L.A or San Francisco or Seattle or Dallas or Phoenix. So very localized data. So this is really a rock solid methodology. So what do we find out? Well, the first thing we look at is jobs. Ask any legislator what your three priorities are and you'll usually hear, well, jobs, jobs, and jobs. All right, there it is. So what's happening with jobs? 35,914 jobs supported by just the nonprofit arts and culture industry organizations and its uh, and its audiences, over, you know, practically 36,000 jobs. Remember, those aren't jobs just at the arts organizations, they're jobs community-wide as a result of spending by the organizations and their audiences. Even in a global economy, arts are very local employers. You know, our industry is not one that's really going to do well by offshoring you know, a bunch of our positions, right? If we go see the symphony and, you know, it's a first violinist and 99 Macintosh computers, we're not gonna <laughs> think, hey, you know, that's gonna be cool for like about 12 seconds, you know? And it's like, we need all the musicians up here. That, that you know, that, you know, economizing thing just doesn't work. Very localized employment. Bottom line, arts, not just food for the soul, but putting food on the table for 35,914 households right here in San Diego. What's another thing? we look at government revenue 116 million dollars in local and state government revenue and you know if you I'll just tell you this nationally if you look at all federal state local government investment in the arts about five billion dollars total government revenue 27 and a half billion dollars small investment big return that's what we're getting when we fund the arts and what this shows is that Arts fund an investment in the arts is a two-way street. You know, this isn't a, you know an investment down some you know black hole of goodness. You know, those dollars don't just disappear into quality of life. They're giving us quality of life and a boost to the economy, jobs, and government revenue. So really, really powerful data. All right, let's uh, drill down a little bit here and. Uh, uh, you know, we talked about, uh, uh, you know, millions, billions, let's just bring it down to a per person unit. Remember we did um, with the uh, San Diego uh, Tourism Authority, 1,261 audience, sorry I'm not getting your name exactly right, but I'll, I'll do that, what, our partner on that one. Um, and uh, uh, 1,261 audience intercept surveys. Uh, and what we found is the typical attendee spends $45.66 per person per event. And this is how those dollars, you know, break down. And you can see about half of it is on uh, meals and the like. And then, you know, over here you got souvenirs and gifts. That was, there's my necktie and ground transportation, 10 bucks, that's my parking. And so you might be looking at lodging. Wow, can you still get a room here for 11 bucks? You know, and, and would you take it if you could get it? No, you probably wouldn't, right? Uh, remember, you know, these are just averages. Not everybody has a lodging cost. Um, other, uh, you know, so nationally we did 212,000 audience intercept surveys. 
you ask that many people a question, you know, with another category, you get some pretty interesting answers. Um, but one of my favorites was um, a Wisconsin farmer who paid somebody $60 to milk his cows so he could go to the theater that night. <laughs> Wasn't that a great story? People are doing what it takes to get to the arts, and so uh, uh, I love that. Now, in addition to how much did you spend at that arts event, we asked folks yet another question, which was, what's your zip code? Because we want to find out, do you live in San Diego County, so are you local, or are you from outside the county, non-local? 30% of attendees came from outside the county. So pretty much one in three attendees to an arts event in San Diego from outside the county. And the way to think about that is, next time you're sitting in the audience and there's someone on your left and someone on your right, one of those folks you know, is traveling a good ways to get here. And do they spend differently? You bet they do. $78.80 per person per event, not including the cost of admission. Uh, that's that red bar right there. Now, we asked those non-local attendees yet another question because we're just that annoying um, and that is you know why are you here you're here on business you're here visiting friends and family 23 percent said oh we came specifically for this arts event so now you can really start to see the pulling power that the arts have and then we looked at the flip side of that question which was well, let's say this arts event wasn't taking place. Then what would you have done? Stayed home, done something else. We gave people a bunch of options. 45% said, I'd travel to a different community to attend a similar kind of arts event. You know, if people got that arts itch, you know, they're going to scratch it. And they'll do it right here in town and keep that, you know, discretionary money local. Or they'll take their money and spend it somewhere else. Um, so, uh, and here's another uh, I thought was a really strong number, uh, and that was the audience overnights. So, 12.4 million attendees, right? And 30% of those folks came from outside San Diego County. 34% of those folks, that group, had a lodging cost. They average $164 per person per event, not including the cost of admission. So, you know, you get that head in a bed, that's when the you know, cash registers really start ringing. And so taken together, you know, the investment in the arts is not an investment in a frill or an extra, it's an investment in an industry that's drawing people to the community, those people are spending money, it's putting heads in beds and you know, cheeks in seats and derriers and cafe chairs, arts are good for local businesses. And that's, you know, that's our big takeaway there. All right. Um, Let's sort of expand uh, the lens a little bit. One of the great things we always look at uh, is volunteerism. Um, I love the volunteer data. I'm just all about the Citizen Army, you know, and uh, it's just people supporting the arts and are supporting arts organizations with their feet, with their hands, with their time, with their industry. Um, such strong volunteer numbers here. 12,377 volunteers giving over a half million hours. This is just in one year, and it, this is just at those 137 responding organizations. But you can actually put a dollar value on that as well. So once again, yeah, good news story and some numbers. So the independent sector tells us the typical volunteer hour is valued at $23.56. So you do the math, you know, pack that up, $13 million in value. Now, that's not part of our 1.1 billion, but it's an important part of this story about what keeps our arts and culture organizations, you know, buoyant and afloat. Um, you can find these full reports, by the way, on the Commission's website. And so, you know, I've been talking about City of San Diego. We also have one just for the Balboa Park uh, organizations. Basically, they represent about two-thirds uh, of the money, uh, $760 million out of the $1.1 million, 23,000 uh, of the jobs. And, uh, uh, and, you know, similar numbers in audience spending, local and non-local. So uh, there's, there's a good story to be told there as well, uh, in, you know, in all those data are, uh, are absolutely freely available. Um, let's see, here's uh, one of the other exciting pieces of this study um, is our national partners. And so when you look at the report, you know, you'll see, uh, you've seen the sort of the design look, you know, it kind of looks like that. And all the numbers are in the reports. But if you flip to the back of the report, you're going to see a bunch of logos of national organizations. Um, so I'm in Washington, D.C., right? The land of national organizations. Yeah, I, there's so many national organizations in Washington. There's a national organization for the national organizations. So I kid you not, it's real. But
but you can make this work for you because you've got um, business organizations like the U.S. Conference of Mayors up here. That's where all the nation's mayors get together twice a year. And, uh, you know, the National Association of Counties for our county leaders, National League of Cities, so many of our city council people belong to there. Um, city County Managers Association. Um, so if you're a city manager or a county manager, you belong to ICMA. And every month your public management magazine shows up. Well, the October issue cover story your arts and economic prosperity study and a six page spread and that's actually the first of a three issue series on arts and the economy so um, your elected leaders your appointed uh, government leaders they're getting this message from their peers uh, as well as from us and from others and advocates um, and keep going you know we've got if you're a funder well there's council on foundations and independent sector um, how about here the conference board that's the organizations for the uh, you know the nation's fortune thousand uh, businesses in this country all partners on your arts and economic prosperity study because they too believe the arts are a fundamental component of a healthy community and they buy into the methodology and they buy into the results. Trust me, they thought this thing was gonna stink down the road. You know, they're not gonna get anywhere near this. So you can feel really confident about these data. Here's an interesting thing. The public actually gets this message as well. So last year I did one of the largest public opinion surveys ever conducted. 3,020 interviews of adult, American adults across the country. And no surprise, 87% of the public said, yeah, the arts improve quality of life. We figured that. I was a little surprised. 82% of the population agrees. Arts are good for local businesses. Arts are good for the local economy. So, you know, when we first started doing this, and by the way, San Diego has been like a champion pioneer in this. This is Arts and Economic Prosperity 5. San Diego goes back to one all the way to the beginning, when it was just one of 33 communities. So, um, so I said Victoria Hamilton here, you know, who kind of got us uh, involved early on in those days. Um, and uh, uh, so um, San Diego's been part of this study for a long time, which is great. And I, I can tell you in the old days, I don't think 82% of the arts community would agree that, you know, the arts were good for the economy. So, uh, you know, I think we've seen a lot of evolution there. Um, all right, uh, before I jump to that. Okay, so that's arts and economic prosperity. I'm gonna expand the lens just a little bit here real quick, uh, because again, we're focusing just on the nonprofit sector, $1.1 billion uh, industry, 35,914 jobs. And a lot of times then folks say, well, that's great, but what about those for-profit businesses? There's a lot more here in San Diego than just nonprofit arts and culture organizations. What about our for-profit film, architecture, design, publishing industries? So we've got another study. I just want to widen the lens real quick for you to something called Creative Industries, Business and Employment in the Arts. And if this one we're looking again, just not at just nonprofits, but also for-profit commercial businesses. I use my data source on this, Dun and Bradstreet. It's the most comprehensive and trusted source for business information in the United States. They track about close to 17 million business establishments. And I can tell you, working with Dun and Bradstreet, 4% of all the nation's business establishments are arts businesses involved in the creation or the distribution of the arts. Well, look what's going on here in San Diego County. 9,266 businesses uh, employing over 37,000 people. And you can see, um, this is San Diego County, uh, you know, the, the businesses spread up and down uh, the coast there, 4.7% of all businesses tracked by Dun & Bradstreet in the county. So we're running ahead of the national average uh, right here in San Diego County. And again, a very conservative approach to economic impact, um, only arts businesses. I don't include medical research or computer programming. You know, both of them are which are very creative, right? But not focused on the arts. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. So uh, I was presenting these data to some economists, uh, uh, you know, not so long ago, and you, know, you should thank me because I hang out with these folks, so you don't have to. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, one of them, I was talking about the universe of the organizations, and uh, um, one of them asked, "Well, question about like who's in, who's out. Did you include morticians as part of your arts universe?" And I was like, "Ah, no, but." Bring it, maybe I'm missing something here. And they go, well, aren't morticians actually involved as presenters? 
of the body <laughs> using lighting and makeup and a new suit for costuming. You know, he never looked as good alive as he does now. So um, no morticians are involved in this. But, uh, um, you know, you can feel very confident about these data. Uh, you can find these creative industries data um, on our website, americansforthearts.org, for all 3,143 counties, for every state uh, assembly and senate district here in California, or any state really, um, congressional districts. So this is a great tool uh, in your advocacy. It's all free, uh, all there, totally available. All right, so this is about the importance of the creative economy. And you know what? All right, so we're Americans for the arts and, you know, and we're the arts community. And so we're talking about arts and the economy to expand the conversation about the arts. The federal government's actually now involved in this. Uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce created something called the Arts and Cultural Production Satellite Account. And they widened the lens even wider than we did. So remember, we started with nonprofit, right? And then I talked about nonprofit and for profit. Well, they widened it to include individual artists, university art departments, um, you know, informal you know, activity, anywhere where there's a dollar transaction taking place. And what they found is that arts and culture, a 730 billion dollar industry in this country. Um, that is 4.2% of the nation's economy. That's a bigger share of GDP than agriculture, transportation, tourism. So, you know, this is a message uh, that is being delivered from a lot of different directions. And commerce got involved in this research because of the importance of creativity and innovation in the global economy. That's how you prosper in this global economy. And there's an understanding or you know, an appreciation that arts are one of the things that drive that creativity. And so uh, you know, they don't build a lot of these uh, satellite accounts. So just the fact that one exists is a big deal. The fact that these numbers are so big um, is, is, is really staggering. So uh, just a quick word a little bit uh, about um, arts and uh, 21st century workforce in the economy. So I'd mentioned the, uh, uh, the conference board, and that's the national organization for the Fortune 1000 companies in this country. They give you the leading index of economic indicators, consumer confidence index. Well, their research also shows that creativity has now soared to the top five applied skills that business leaders are looking for. In fact, it's leapfrog the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Although, you know, we talk about that as researchers. Of course, you gotta be able to read, write, and do math. But if you can't take your creativity and apply it to, you know, your area of specialty or knowledge or engineering or medicine or, uh, you know, you know, coding, well, those are the jobs that are being shipped offshore, being automated. 72% of business leaders say creativity is of high importance in hiring. 85% of those folks say we're struggling to find the people we're looking for. And so we followed up and we asked them, all right, well, there's no typing test for creativity. You know, how do you know if you got a creative person on the line? Well, there were two big indicators of creativity, starting your own business, so entrepreneurial activity, and study of the arts especially while in college. And they write in the conclusion of this report, it's clear that the arts, music, drawing, drama, dance, literature, media, provide skills sought by employers of the third millennium. Really powerful research, and this speaks to the business community uh, in such a huge way. And again, you can just Google it, Ready to Innovate, it's on our website, you, you can just Google it and find it as well. Um, but this is one of the other economic benefits that San Diego is pulling as a result of this incredible arts community that we're in. And here's why. Um, I can tell you I've been to some other cities uh, where, you know, the, where I hear are things like, our number one export is highly educated young people. You know, I mean, talk about like losing the wrong thing at the, you know, at this time, right? So, and they're, you know, so they've been trying to figure out, well, how do we keep you here? You know, um, you know, we've raised you, we've educated you, and now you're leaving. You know, so, um, and and these, you know, this young 21st century new economy workers, uh, this is what they're saying. Look, you want me to be creative and innovative in the workplace. I'm a creative person. I, you know, I want creativity in my life. I want art and culture. I want arts maker spaces. You know, I want a vibrant downtown with restaurants and, you know, things to do. I want to live in a cool place, right? Who doesn't? Well, that's something that the arts are bringing and, and attracting that workforce. And here's the other thing about the new economy. You know, when I graduated from state, you know, in 1984, um, 
I, you know, I packed up my 64 Dodge Dart with a punch button automatic. I mean, it was already an old car. But uh, I, I'd go to whoever would have me. These days, people are picking the communities that they want to live in, moving there, and then figuring they'll make it work. You know, I'll start my own business. I'll hook on with some kind of incubator or, um, you know, so many of my skills. I can work in tech and biotech and pharmacology. You know, they're so transferable. So this is a domestic phenomenon, an international phenomenon. On, and if that's where the business is, if that's where the workers are going, the businesses will follow. Because the businesses these days, right? You know, what do you need? You know, uh, electrical outlet, room for the satellite dish, you're good to go, you know? So uh, uh, that, this is one of the big evolutions that's changing in our global economy and one of the benefits that the arts are providing. So what's this look like, actually, in a little bit in action? Uh, so this happy looking fella, uh, Thomas Sudoff, uh, he got the 2013 Nobel Prize uh, for medicine. And the reporter's like, hey, congratulations, professor. Uh, who was your most influential teacher? Without missing a beat, he said, I owe it all to my bassoon teacher. <laughs> and he went on to explain how um, you know, his music and arts education gave him the habits of mind that made him a great scientist. Uh, you know, perseverance, pattern recognition, ability to ask a question and deal with you know, multiple solutions and that kind of thing. Um, so you know, it shows up in all kinds of ways. And it turns out he may not really be that anomalous of a situation. Uh, there's a, a researcher at Michigan State University, um, Robert Root Bernstein, who studied all the Nobel laureates going back to the very beginning and found that they are 17 times more likely to be actively involved as arts maker, you know, musician, painter, uh, performer, than scientists at other scientific societies. So, you know, there's really something happening there. And, and this really talks to the importance of arts education, which we heard about, and we can talk about that in the discussion in the panel. But, you know, bottom line, uh, when the arts are part of a young person's education, they're performing better academically. Better grade point averages, better test scores, lower dropout rates, um, findings that cut across all socioeconomic strata. So, powerful numbers there. So let me wrap up. Um, we already heard about uh, uh, the Mona Lisa earlier from the uh, early museum days. Well, this is a pair a picture from the Louvre in, two, uh, uh, in 1912 in Paris. Bad news, the Mona Lisa got stolen. It wasn't by the Met, though, thankfully. So, uh, uh, but it took them two years to get the Mona Lisa back, from 1912 to 1914. But in the two years that the Mona Lisa was gone, more people went to see where the painting had been hanging, you know where this is going, than saw the actual painting itself in the previous 14 years. So um, it's so easy to take what we do, our arts and our cultural product and process, and how we vitalize and animate this community, improve our quality of life, it's so, so easy to take all that for granted. But the fact is, we need to be talking and telling this story all the time, again and again and again. We've got to be vigilant. We have to make sure everybody hears it. Um, and it's our stories and our numbers, right? So, you know, our arts community, we're full of great stories, but now we got the numbers. I've got a golden rule in Americans for the Arts. No numbers without a story, no stories without a number. You need both. And you got to tell it again and again and again. Be relentless with the messaging. Go to the website, find the report. And here's one of the interesting things you can do. On page 15 and 16 of the report, you'll find the Arts and Economic Prosperity Calculator. You can use uh, the calculator, you, know, you can do this on the back of a napkin, and you can calculate the economic impact of your museum, of your arts organization. And in 2018, you know, Dana and crew will get together and you know, survey and send an email to all those 293 organizations, and only this time ask for just two numbers. Give me your expenditures, give me your attendance. And we'll be able to calculate and update you know, that economic impact finding. We've got boards of directors. Tell that story to them again and again. Make sure they're doing something. You know, we heard earlier, it's uh, about getting other people to tell the story. Advocacy, you know, there's like 12 volume sets on how to advocate and lobby and all that kind of thing. But you know what, you can boil it down to three, three questions. First question, what's the message? Well, we talked about a whole bunch of message today, right? Arts are good for the economy. Arts and 21st century workforce. Arts are an industry that supports jobs, generates, you know, and drives tourism. Who gets the message? You know, well, we've got great city council champions here today, but we gotta make sure everybody on that council is getting the message. Who are the authorizers in our environment? We gotta make sure they hear it again and again and again. Identify that person and give them no peace. 
You know, that's how you do it. We've got to advocate. We've got to make sure the people on our board are telling the story. And the hospital CEO and the business leaders, I can tell you they're hearing it from their national associations. So um, be relentless in that. And then the third thing is, again, who delivers the message? And that is so powerful. And it's as powerful as the numbers, honestly, sometimes. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, we always make sure there's an arts presence at both political conventions before the, the presidential elections. And so, you know, we were the Republicans, and uh, Mike Huckabee was uh, chairing our panel of Republicans. We had a, a lot of Republicans in the theater and hearing about the value and importance of the arts. And um, the mayor of Mesa, Arizona was there uh, and told an interesting story where it was budget hearing night for the city. and. Um, uh, uh, and so, you know, there were all the arts people were up there doing their three minutes. And um, he noticed the chief of police was there, which wasn't that unusual, you know, city council meeting. But he was in full chief of police regalia, hat, tie, medals, uh, which was a little different. And after all the arts folks had gone up and done their three minutes, he asked for three minutes. And he went up and he basically said, you know, if you got to take a cut out of the arts budget, I'd rather you just took it out of the public safety budget. Because when they do their job well, it makes my job easier, right? Can you imagine if we had a thousand police chiefs on that message? So who delivers the message is so important, and that's the other business we're in, in cultivating those community leaders. So this is a great story, again, arts and industry. Everything you do to advance the arts is important, and you're all very important for doing it. Thank you very much. This is my website, that's my email. Thank you.